Oh, it's your first time coming to the speaker series, welcome. Uh, we organize it on the third Thursday of uh, every month, and as we say, it's where we gather to build our capacity to fight to win, and it's where we gather to discuss issues that are critical to the success of poor people's movements. I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Yogi Acharya. I'm an organizer with the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Uh, welcome. It's so wonderful to see so many people out uh, for uh, this event, and especially this event because of what the po of, because of the possibilities that we're looking at. So I'm really happy to see so many people engaged in this uh, discussion. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered today on the traditional territories of the Huron, Wendat, the Batoon, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of Credit River First Nations. We declare, we say this land acknowledgement at the beginning of every uh, demonstration or event to declare us as a poor people's movement in solidarity with uh, indigenous struggles for sovereignty and self-determination. A significant concern, especially in the context where Doug Ford goes on air and says he's going to drive a bulldozer himself if he needs to in order to get access to uh, indigenous territories for the sake of mining. Uh, we'll get into all of that momentarily. Uh, we have two speakers tonight. Uh, John Clark, who's an organizer with uh, OCAP, and lived through and fought through the period of uh, hard-right government in Ontario, the previous uh, version under Mike Harris in the mid-90s, and will share both some insight and lessons from those struggles, but also uh, OCAP's ideas for what we can do now to prepare uh, for such a government again. So with all of that said, and without further ado, let me invite up uh, John Clark. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we have to recognize there is a real possibility that in June um, we will see the Tories led by Doug Ford elected and forming a government. Now, I'm not predicting that and I'm certainly not wishing that to happen, um, but I think we would be making a very big mistake if we didn't give some thought to how we're going to react on June 8th if the Tories get in and if Doug Ford uh, gets his bum in the Premier's chair at Queen's Park. Um, because I think it would be a very big mistake to on June 8th say, oh my goodness, how did that happen? What are we going to do now? Uh, we lived through a government to which we can make some similarities to Doug Ford, the Harris Tories in the 1990s. And the question was posed of, is what a government like that does inevitable? Or is there a way to fight back? Is there a way to oppose it? Is there a way to stop it? Now, um, the, um, we are quite clear that the agenda of austerity and social cutbacks, attacks on public services and such like, uh, didn't start with Doug Ford. They're not gonna start with Doug Ford. They're already underway. And there's no doubt that they're gonna continue uh, regardless of the electoral outcome. But at the same time, it would be a mistake to say everything's just the same. If Ford is elected, we will see an enormous intensification of the attack on working class people uh, and on poor communities under attack, the war on the poor. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Ford, of course, plays this populist, as they call it, card where he claims to be someone who speaks for ordinary people. Uh, out in Etobicoke North, you see his signs that he's putting up where he is himself trying to get elected as the local MPP, and he's calling himself the premier for the people. Um, but the reality is that Ford is a right-wing Tory bastard, and uh, he is a multi-millionaire, and he is proposing an array of measures uh, such as he's spelling out at the moment, that will be devastating uh, if, they, if, if he's able to get away with it. Um, he talks in billions of dollars in what he calls efficiencies, so that he can hand massive tax breaks to rich people. Um, but those efficiencies are, of course, going to be a tax on poor people, going to be a tax on health care, going to be a tax on uh, public transportation, going to be a tax on all the things that people need. And it's happened under Kathleen Wynne, but it would intensify enormously um, under, uh, under Doug Ford. 
And as uh, Yogi intimated in the beginning, uh, it's not just a question that he's going to cut social programs and attack public services. He's really going to wallow in backwardness. Um, he's going to unleash uh, a, a tide of, of social regression in this province. Uh, he went to a meeting of the Somali community, of all things, and suggested that what he wanted to do was to reinstate the Tavis um, uh, police squad, Toronto police squad, that, that, that carried out a kind of a racist reign of terror in, in communities of, uh, of colour. Um, he's, um, he's proposing um, to open up uh, northern Ontario, including, uh, in, including indigenous land, to mining interests. And, and as Yogi suggested, he even said that if necessary he would drive the bulldozer himself. So, um, if Ford wins, the question has to be posed is, is it going to be possible to build a movement that can stop him? I know I'm not saying a movement that can, you know, complain about what he's doing, or a movement that can critique what he's doing, or a movement that can be very indignant and severely upset about what he's doing. I'm talking about, is it possible to actually stop a government that gets elected that proceeds to put the boots to communities and workers throughout the province, that rips up the agreement to raise the minimum wage, that attacks workers' rights, that, that devastates poor communities? Is it possible to do something about that? And um, it is not without historical precedent for governments to be defeated by movements of people. Right? Just because he gets elected, if he gets elected, that doesn't mean that we then say, well, we've got him for four years, there's nothing we can do about it. If he decides to uh, eliminate social housing, if he decides to do all these things, it's just the way it is, there's nothing we can do to stop it. The truth is that if we are capable of responding to a right-wing Tory government by building a movement of workers and of communities under attack that can, can introduce into this province a level of economic disruption and that can fill the streets with a movement that's so large and so defiant they haven't got enough cops to deal with it. If we can put that in place, it's going to be possible. But to do that, we've got to empty the workplaces, fill the streets, and we've got to fight very, very seriously to win. So we're beginning to look at laying the groundwork now for preparing for the possibility of a Ford government. We've called a meeting of, of allies in the last while, and we've come up with the beginnings of a plan. Um, in a while, we're going to pass around sign-up sheets. On June 2nd, uh, we went out and took a little look at Doug's uh, local campaign headquarters in North Etobicoke. A very charming little spot, beautiful place for people to gather. And what we're going to do is go to his campaign headquarters on June 2nd with a demonstration and confront him uh, with the message that the resistance has begun. We're not even waiting for him to get elected if he gets elected. We're going to challenge him and we're going to challenge his agenda and we're going to call him on his hatred. We're going to call him on his racism. We're going to call him on his hatred for working people. And we're going to, uh, we're going to challenge him right there on his doorstep. If he is elected... Uh, we're going to work with our allies to convene an assembly. An assembly that represents movements, that represents rank and file workers, that represents trade unions, um, an assembly that can begin to map out a strategy of actually fighting back in a way that can make a, can make a real difference. Um, there is a comparison to be made to the Conservative government of Mike Harris that, that uh, held power in this province from 1995 to 2003. Um, when Harris was elected, uh, he proceeded, the first thing he did was cut social assistance rates by 21.6% and then froze them for the rest of the period when he was in power. Um, he attacked social housing. He cut the budget of the Ministry of Labour by 40% so that any enforcement of employment standards was off the table. It was a brutal, brutal period. There was resistance. There was very, very important resistance. Um, OCAP played a good and important role in it, but it went way beyond any one organisation. Uh, trade unions, social movements uh, took to the streets, and uh, by the end of 95, what began was a series of actions that became known as the Ontario Days of Action. Now, the Ontario Days of Action represent uh, an incredible contradiction. 
You know, the best of the best of movements and the worst of movements, you might say. Because you saw with those days of action a glimpse of the incredible power that working class people have. Um, what it involved was city by city, they they there would be what were in effect, although the union leaders didn't want to call it that, general strikes. There would be shutdowns. Um, there would be shutdowns of factories, there would be shutdowns of public transportation systems, things would close. And then there would be, later that day or the next day, a mass rally of sometimes, uh, sometimes tens of thousands of people, sometimes well over a hundred thousand people. Vast, vast demonstrations took place. And that showed the real possibilities. When the one came to Toronto, I remember standing in the financial district and the subway was closed. Um, and you realised that were it not for the thousands and thousands of demonstrators on the streets, Toronto would be a ghost town. Everything had been shut down by the strength and power of working class people. It had incredible possibilities. But at the same time, the fight through the days of action was never carried through to a conclusive, decisive, uh, in, in, a, in a conclusive and decisive way. Um, because what happened was this, was you would have an action. They began with London, Ontario. A very, very powerful action with, uh, with uh, car factories shut down, with, uh, with uh, enormous uh, strike movement and a huge demonstration. It looked incredibly powerful. There was a great sense of hope, a great sense of possibility. And then from the head stage, you expect the call for escalation, for more, the next step in this struggle. And all of a sudden, it's just, we'll get in touch. And then you wait, and you wait, and the, week, the days go by, and then there's an announcement of the next place. And there was never any clear plan to escalate the fight through the days of action to the point where this province could be shut down and made ungovernable and the Tories defeated. That, that, that didn't happen. Um, so what we're saying is that we need to prepare a movement in which rank and file workers and people in communities have infinitely more power and say and input in, in what goes on. That's why we're proposing to try to call together assemblies, assemblies at the local level um, that, can actually, that can actually map out plans. It's no good for a group of uh, union leaders in a room somewhere to have a discussion and say, well, we'll do this, and then go off and pick uh, a group of people that they deem to be community representatives and, uh, and, and organize the next relatively safe step. If we're going to stop forward, it's going to have to be a growing, powerful, escalating, explosive movement that is democratically controlled at the base by working class people and by communities under attack and by, uh, and by poor people. So that is the, uh, that, that's essentially what we're looking to do. And right now, if you look to the south of us in the United States, there is a movement that has grown up amongst teachers. Right? Teachers are challenging the, the destruction of public education in the United States. And if you look at those teachers' movements that have thrown governments into crisis, it's very rank and file driven. It's very much driven by the teachers themselves and not by, uh, and not by uh, bureaucratic leaders. So those are the kind of notions that we want to put forward a movement that can actually fight to win if this man and his government takes power, and we'll need a movement to fight against austerity uh, even, if he is, uh, even if he's personally defeated and the Tories are stopped. I just want to say really that what we are looking at in, if Doug Ford is elected is an incredible moment, not just in the life of this province, but an incredible mo moment in terms of the whole struggle against austerity and cutbacks and the war on the poor and the war on working class people that's happening internationally. Um, if, uh, if, if we compare Ford to Harris, the comparison is actually only limited. Because the agenda today that we are facing internationally of austerity and cutbacks is infinitely worse than, uh, than existed during the time uh, of Mike Harris in the 1990s. Um, the World Bank, if anybody's heard of those, uh, those charming people, the World Bank just issued a report. 
in which they are calling for minimum wages and workers' rights to be simply eliminated across the board on a massive scale internationally. So if Ford comes to power, this right-wing thug comes to power, he will be operating in a context where he has um, a blessing from global capitalism to carry out the attack and to, uh, to, to deepen the attack in a way that, that Mike Harris never had. So um, let me say that we would go into a fight against Doug Ford, not with a sense of dread and pessimism, but with a sense of possibility and optimism and hope and strength. Um, in Amongst working class people in the province of Ontario, workers and people organising at the community level, there is more than enough power to defeat a preposterous buffoon like Doug Ford. There is the strength and there is the power to do it, but that power must be unleashed. It can't be suppressed, it can't be held back. And the perspective we have is to prepare now for that possibility in a very, very serious way. In OCAP we like to use the term fight to win. If Ford is elected, we are not interested in making poignant statements about how terrible it is. We are not interested in sobbing about how dreadful things are. We're not even interested in just being angry and upset. We want to put together a clear strategy to actually build a movement in the province of Ontario that can defeat the austerity agenda, can defeat Doug Ford, and then can start to pose the question of the kind of society that we want to live in. We don't want to live in a society where social housing is destroyed. We don't want to live in a society where injured workers are abandoned where disabled people live in poverty, where welfare payments are so disgustingly low that people can't survive on them. We don't want to see people going to work and working for poverty wages. We don't want to see uh, communities of colour under attack by racist police. We want to fight for a very different kind of society. And the possibilities opened up by defeating a government like Doug Ford would be absolutely enormous. So we say, let's, let's meet this possibility with hope, with confidence, with strength, and let's fight to win. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that, John. Why don't we start with a back and forth, then I may take two at a time, answer, then take two more. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay. It's a comment. Uh, I can speak from here, I guess. Well, sisters and friends, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, John's remarks were right on, right on point. Uh, but I want to take one small step back before um, Mike Harris. And I want to refer to the Bob Ray government of the uh, NDP. Because Bob Ray paved the way for Mike Harris. And how did he do that? Uh, the, the election of the NDP in uh, September yeah, 1990, I believe, was quite a surprise. Uh, its policies were progressive, written on the back of, a, uh, of an envelope, as it were. And they proceeded to break every one of them. And when austerity took its bite, the Ray, the Ray government declared that the working class is going, to help, is going to have to pay a role, play a role in trying to shore up the prospects for maintaining the stability of the economy, i.e. the capitalist economy in Ontario. And so there were massive cuts, there was privatization, and there were raid days, where the provincial government actually intervened in the, the collective bargaining process and took millions of dollars out of the pockets of public service workers. That demoralized working people, and the NDP's membership went down from 35,000 to 13,000 in Ontario. And then Mike Harris was elected, uh, partly as a, as a reaction to that sense of hopelessness and uh, a search for something as an alternative to the NDP and the Liberals in Ontario. And the Harris uh, days are well known and well described by, by John. And we had the days of action, general strikes in 10 cities across Ontario. And the biggest one took place in Toronto on October the 26th, 1996, when some socialists, in fact, went up to the Davisville yards and blocked uh, the subway and transit workers access to the yards and that meant no transit and a million workers stayed home and the next day a quarter million were in the streets of University Avenue right up to 
the legislature at Queen's Park. Now, with Toronto shut down on October 25th, 1996, the next logical step would have been a province-wide general strike. Just as John said, we need to prepare now. But instead, the union bureaucracy, led by Buzz Hargrove of the then Canadian Auto Workers, pulled the plug on the days of action. And the next protests in other cities were simply um, a, a shadow, a, a faint shadow of the, of the Toronto massive general strike. So what are the lessons of this experience uh, to, what, to which John referred and to which I referred going one step further back? Two lessons. One, the way to defeat Doug Ford, in part, one way to defeat Doug Ford, of course, it's obvious, it's to vote NDP. Not for the Liberals, a Bay Street party of the bosses. The NDP is a Labour party. But we must have no confidence that the NDP will advance a worker's agenda without being kicked every step of the way to implement the progressive uh, elements of its platform. And that's what the NDP Socialist Caucus, in which my party, Socialist Action, is involved, do. We push the NDP to the left. Right, wrap up. And in fact, much of Andrea Horvath's platform today, Pharmacare, Post-Secondary Education, Free, Renationalize Ontario Hydro, comes straight out of the playbook of the Socialist Caucus. So we need to build a stronger left and mobilize the working class to continue the fight, even during an NDP government. But the second lesson is, as John said, if Thug Ford wins on June the 7th, we have to redouble our efforts and begin preparing for general strike action, because our slogan must be, fight or die, socialism or barbarism. Go ahead. Uh, just a couple quick points. Uh, with her, John mentioned the teacher strikes in the United States. One thing that he didn't mention about those that is truly remarkable is that that wave of strikes has all happened in right-to-work states, where workers are stripped of their collective bargaining rights, where workers are stripped, stripped of the right to a closed union shop. And because it happened in right-to-work states, or they happened in right-to-work states, they were all, as he indicated, movements from below. In fact, they were built up in opposition to both the austerity agenda in those states and in opposition to the union bureaucracies which controlled the teachers unions in those states, and in fact, who proved to be impediments to the building of those struggles. And I mention that because uh, as somebody who spent 40 years or so in the labor movement, you're going to have a similar problem here. The union bureaucracy is going to be sometimes helpful, but often an obstacle. One other thing I want to do is mention two events, and I would encourage people to go to these events, to link with them, to try and draw them into the process that uh, John outlined, and unite, in fact, unite the struggles that are embodied in those events. One is June 1st, the Queen's Park Injured Workers' Day. Injured Workers' Day is really important, and nobody is more victimized by the austerity agenda than injured workers. That's at 11 o'clock at Queen's Park, Friday, June the 1st. I encourage people to show up. The turnouts are usually pretty weak, but it's an opportunity to help build the kind of struggle John has been talking about. And the other is June 16th, which is going to be a, a build on the 15 and Fairness campaign, and it's going to send a message to whichever government gets elected to continue the struggle uh, that was waged around 15 and Fairness to change the Employment uh, Standards Act, and to go forward with the objective of winning more things. And that will be at Queen's Park as well on the afternoon of Saturday, June 16th. Thank you. I'm going to go with uh, you, and then I'll go to you. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. I'm an activist with uh, Fight Back. And I, I agree with everything that John's just said. And, and I think that we definitely need to build uh, a broader movement against a potential Doug Ford government. And I'm very interested in, in discussing with the, the, the OCAP activists uh, about uh, organizing some United Front actions about that, so maybe we could talk later. But uh, if we're gonna fight Doug Ford, we have to understand what is Doug Ford? What is this phenomenon? And, and we've seen it internationally. There's, uh, you know, we've got Trump in the States, uh, we've got Le Pen in France, we've got you know, uh, UKIP and Brexit in Britain. Uh, you're getting this uh, sort of rise of, uh, sort of anti-establishment uh, right-wing movements, but at the same time you're also getting anti-establishment left-wing movements. 
So you've got Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, Melanchon, uh, Podemos in Spain, you know, uh, things like this. And, and we need to build that uh, mass anti-establishment alternative of the left in Canada. Uh, we don't have it yet, but we desperately, desperately need it. Because the symptom of the disease is Rob Ford, but the disease itself is capitalism. The fact is that the system cannot provide a solution for working class people, the capitalist system, and people are, are hate the status quo. They hate the current conditions. They, you know, we're, we're under you know, the, uh, the win liberals. People hate the liberals. They hate the status quo, and you cannot defeat the anti-establishment right with the status quo liberalism. The only way you can defeat the anti-establishment right is with an anti-establishment radical left-wing message that says, yes, the, the present situation sucks, but don't blame working class people, don't blame homeless people, don't blame immigrants. No, blame the capitalists, blame those who actually control the economy, actually control society. And that's what we, those socialist ideas, that's what we've got to build a mass movement around that can actually win. And we, have, and we also have to bring in the, the majority of the working class and the organisations of the working class that we can have a days of action like we had in the 90s, but this time they won't get sold out. They'll actually go, they'll strike, they'll win. That's a movement I want to build and want to be part of. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. And then back. Um, thank you so much for your remarks. I just have a question. It's, it's great to hear about the action on June 2nd. But in terms of what we can do that's per per perhaps non-partisan leading up into the election to stop Doug Ford, um, if you had any other suggestions. So I'm going to take one more. That, that was at the very back. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello. Respond for OCAP on the question of um, of the uh, the electoral process itself. Um, I have to say that the position of our organisation, uh, with various with various uh, with various people's opinions running the way they do, we're not going to call for a vote for any particular political party. We recognise that the austerity agenda is something that is coming from, uh, that, is that is going to be implemented, um, but it's a question of degree. And we recognise that Doug Ford represents, um, represents, if he's elected, an enormous intensification. We're going to go out and challenge Ford on the campaign trail precisely because, precisely because um, he represents the most extreme manifestation of everything we're fighting today. Um, and and I, I have to say that at the end of the day, I don't know how much influence we're going to have on the actual electoral process that's going to unfold over the next few weeks. Um, I wish we could actually, uh, I wish we could actually forego the electoral process and have the kind of society that we want to, that we, that, that we want to have and that we need. But the reality is that at the moment, Ford is being fed. Um, Ford is indeed a right-wing populist and has used that, has used that, has played that card. But the main reason why Ford has come up to the extent that he has is because he represents this vague promise of change, and there is this hatred for the liberals. They've been around for 15 years. People are sick of them, uh, and with good cause. People have every reason to be sick of the uh, progressive brand of uh, austerity that the Liberals have rammed down their throats. 
Whether the NDP is going to be, a, it, it will certainly capture uh, a share of the votes that, 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 that the Liberals lose. Whether it will be powerful enough to actually stop Ford and create a situation with an NDP government or Ford doesn't have a, a majority, I, I don't know. I can't say. Um, but I can say that we're facing a major attack. I can say that the sharpest form of that, of that attack is going to be Doug Ford, and I believe that we have to be ready for it. Go with Judy. Go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat uh, what you said. People have died. People have died. Women have fought hard to vote. And people have even died to fight for the right to vote. We have to, uh, we have, to have an alternative. We can't just say, don't vote. Because that will just help the Tories get in. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, I'll take one more question and then we'll do a response. I got Sarah back there. The question Sarah is asking is what is the next that OCAP is talking about? Is that a fair summary? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't actually say don't vote. I, I simply said that as, a, as an organisation we don't have a consensus. We don't have a position that I can put forward in terms of uh, uh, telling people whether they should vote and how they should vote. That's the reality of, of our organisation. I understand that people died for the right to vote. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in Manchester in the 1800s, they, uh, they chopped down uh, workers who were demanding the right to vote. There was a militant, powerful movement calling for the right to vote. I'm not, I'm not saying that people shouldn't vote. I'm just, brief, just expressing honestly the reality of, of where our organisation stands. Um, and in terms of... Um, in terms of the, um, in terms of next steps, I mean, if, um, if what what is absolutely essential, regardless of electoral strategies, I think we would, all of us in this room agree, is that what we need is a powerful extra parliamentary movement that can be powerful enough that it can actually influence the course of events, that it can actually challenge the agenda of austerity. If the Liberals. Uh, were to uh, perform a political miracle and uh, and uh, pull themselves out of the uh, the toilet, which they're, they're they're disappearing into at the moment, and get themselves re-elected and form the government. It's clear we would be fighting that same austerity agenda. We've been fighting it for 15 years under these people. If the NDP were elected, I, I would essentially agree with the position that was put forward, that there would be some progressive elements of their platform, but that they would they would be not enough and they would, they would be backsliding. An NDP government would almost certainly be reluctant to move forward and would require enormous pressure from, from, from a movement to challenge it. If, uh, yeah. if, uh, if the Tories are elected, then uh, clearly we're dealing with the purest form of social regression and viciousness, and uh, we're going to be dealing with a, an open, openly declared and clear-cut class war. And class war is fine with us, but we just really don't think it should be one-sided. Um, so, uh, what we want to, to try to do is to actually, is, a, is to actually, yes, I mean, the demonstration that we're suggesting on the second, and in a moment maybe we can pass around sign-up sheets for people who like to take the buses, but what we're, what we're suggesting is to, is to really deliver a powerful message to Ford even before he wins, if he's going to win, that, that there is a movement of resistance that is brewing. And, but what we must do is we must then proceed to build that movement. Um, it certainly needs to be built on the basis of a province-wide movement. Um, we, need, uh, we need those indigenous people who are going to be under attack by Ford. Uh, we need a powerful movement in communities of colour that are under attack. We need poor people to stand up in a united way. And we need to ensure that the great power and strength of organised workers in trade unions is also part of it. And if we were able to build that, then we would be able to stop. We would be able to stop the implementation of the agenda. We could create a situation where Ford's government 
was paying such a price in terms of economic disruption, uh, was faced with such a profound political crisis that the, that the people on Bay Street who are presently, uh, are presently saying, that's great, Doug, go and get them, would say, Doug, you've made such a mess of things, made such a hash of things, you might say, um, that, that you, need to be, you need to be stopped, that you can't proceed. Uh, you could actually create something that powerful. It's possible, it can be done. I can remember uh, in the 90s when uh, Berlusconi in, uh, in Italy was, uh, was attacking working class people and a really powerful movement arose. There was actually an editorial in the Financial Times of London saying Berlus Berlusconi is a wild card and we no longer have confidence in him. We could actually create that kind of a, we could actually create that kind of a power, that kind of a possibility. So, uh, we'll take some more questions, but before we do, I'm now going to pass around this, uh, these sign-up sheets. And, uh, and what I would ask is, um, the bus, well, the, the action is called for Ford's office, which is just north of Rexdale Boulevard, um, uh, on Kipling Avenue, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, June the 2nd. That means we'll be organising buses to leave from this area uh, sometime shortly after noon on that day. If you're interested and you think you're available, uh, then please write down your name, your phone number and email if you have it. Okay, so I have a question and then I see a couple more hands back there, one here, one there. I'm interested because you spoke earlier about lessons from the days of action and the role the, the labor movement played in terms of their awesome capacity to mobilize, but also the limitations that came with it. Uh, yet, our co-speaker, who unfortunately uh, couldn't show up, uh, Megan Whitfield, is with the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, uh, somebody who's involved within that same labor movement. So I'm curious more than anything, as somebody who wasn't around in, in Ontario, uh, during the days of action, and perhaps that's the case for some other people in this room, is what was different about CUPW's role that could serve as a model for the labor movement now, perhaps. Um, and then there were questions. I'll take one back there, and then I'll go to you. In terms of looking at the election and in terms of the people who are disappointed in electoral politics, uh, it's important to recognize the validity of the way they feel, because electoral politics haven't given rise to any substantive change in this province or in this country for over 40 years. So if people are not engaged, it's quite understandable that they're not engaged when the only option provided to them is electoral politics, how they vote. So it would be my view that the, the mode of force of change is the actual physical engagement of people to do and engage in mass actions like the one that is being proposed in front of Doug Ford's office. The more people that show up in front of that office, the more coverage we'll get in terms of the opposition to Ford-like politics in this province. So that kind of mobilization for mass action is the kind of thing that will change people's minds because they are actually engaged in the process of opposing it as opposed to simply arguing with each other about whether they should support the NDP or the Liberals. If we uh, put all our eggs in that basket, the basket of electoral politics, we're going to be barking up a dead end. We need to engage people in mass actions, and after that mass action is done, we need to engage in mass actions in conjunction with other organizations of a similar bent, like Black Lives Matter, like Idle No More, like those organizations which are genuinely oppositional to the powers that be. And that's what will get young people engaged. That's what will get old people engaged. When they see that there's a possibility of change and when they themselves are engaged in that action. So I think uh, for the time being, let's look at mass actions. Let's get people out to this big mass action on June 2nd and show this province we don't want Doug Ford politics. We don't want politics of the powers that be. We want politics for the people and for Mother You couldn't have heard that comment from a better person. Jim is a longtime warrior and was most recently uh, had to be dragged out of City Hall when we were occupying it around the shelter crisis in December. So th thank you, Jim. We'll take one more and then go to John again. Go ahead. Uh, 
I'm Tom Smarta. I, I get a sense that a lot of people are, you know, pissed off and feel they've been had, but that's as far as it goes. And then you've got this apathy where a lot of people figure, in my opinion, uh, as long as my, I don't get a tax increase and somebody takes my garbage away from the curb, I'm pretty much satisfied with the status quo. And you can multiply that over millions of people. So, and then, you've, and then the so-called left is maybe not organized and they're arguing about who to vote for or whatever. But the agenda from the corporate privatized bank uh, system, they are planning, they hire the best consultants, they pay them well, they own the corporate media, they are running their agenda, which is to privatize the planet, uh, to uh, eliminate any opposition, to use police and military force if necessary, violating rights to consolidate control over resources in order to be able to make a buck and sell crap and the byproduct is externalizing costs and leaving toxic waste and death behind them. That's pretty clear about their agenda. Then, how can we look collectively when there's more of us than there is of them and that we have intelligence and concerns and we care and not to sound populist, but how do we house, clothe, and feed one another without destroying the planet? I can talk to somebody, I'll just finish off, I can talk to somebody and find out what side of that line they're on. Are we looking at sustainably how to house, clothe, and feed one another, sustainably without destroying the planet, or are we looking at consolidating control and a big F you for anybody who doesn't run this agenda? And I think the point was just what was very interesting to watch was that the Keystone Pipeline, on its own, was no longer considered a viable investment because of opposition. And now you've got the liberal government was saying no to the Keystone Pipeline in BC and Rachel Motley, and the, also an NDP in uh, Alberta, is saying we're not going to even sell oil to British Columbia. We're going to just cut you guys off. So they're using economic and resource warfare to run through an agenda with the collusion of governments which are not divided and uh, because from a capitalist perspective, the Keystone Pipeline is not even viable. Um, so a couple of things. Um, to say, I, I mean, I think during the, um, during the days of action, which is going back a, f a few years now, um, OCAP did work very closely with the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Uh, generally, we, when, when the actions were called, um, the, uh, the, the organisers generally sent us to uh, postal worker picket lines. Um, I, I suppose it was a sort of get all the rotten eggs in one basket kind of a, kind of a, a strategy. But, um, but we worked closely and I just, I, I, I know that within the discussions that took place within the trade unions, what marked the Canadian Union of Postal Workers was they were indeed pushing for a, a strategy of serious escalation. Um, you see, what happened was is that you'd have this, you'd have an event that, that would take place. The union leaders would call it and they decide they're going to do London. So that's a major centre. It's got some major auto plants there. It's a serious, it's a serious proposition. Then they moved on to Hamilton, which was um, perhaps less deindustrialised than it is now, but it, it was a major, major important working class centre. Very, very, the, the rally that took place there after the Hamilton action was enormous. Uh, one of the largest in Canadian history at that time. Um, but then they moved on after you didn't know what was going to happen next, they moved on to Waterloo Region. And no disrespect to Waterloo Region, but in terms of the, the power of the local working class population, it was, a, it was definitely a step down. So you'd have, you'd, you'd have these incredible rallies and, and strike actions and then they'd, they'd say, we'll get back to you in a few weeks and let you know what the next one's going to be. And you, you never knew if they were going to do Thunder Bay or uh, Toronto or Polar Bear Provincial Park. You didn't know what was going to be the next one that was going to happen. And so, um, and so that, that sort of tended to dissipate the, the strength and the momentum of the movement. 
And then you had the Toronto days of action, uh, the Metro days of action, they called it at the time. And it was... Mm, yeah, it was the most... That's correct. It was the most, um, it was the most, it was the, it involved the largest demonstration that had taken place at that time in Canadian political history, and it involved an incredible, uh, an incredible general strike action. But the very power of the thing, it was clear when you listened to the speeches that were coming from a lot of the people who were organising it, that they decided that that was as far as they were prepared to go. Mike Harris, who knew a few things, uh, not a smart man, but he had a certain animal cunning, um, he said, uh, as this vast demonstration marched past his, uh, his party's uh, gathering uh, of a couple of hundred thousand people, he said it was a good show. And he wasn't actually wrong. That's how it was seen in, in, in large measure as a, as a show. But it needed to be more than a show. Uh, what you needed was an actual strategy to close down larger and larger centres and then close down several places at once. And then set the date for a province-wide action and shut, shut the province down. You needed to actually escalate and build that. And it makes an enormous difference how it's, how it's organised. And that's why I make the point about the poster workers at that time having a different orientation. After the days of action had been called off, and after uh, a major teacher strike had been, uh, had been uh, let go in terms of its possibilities, um, there was this move by the Tories at the time to gut the Employment Standards Act, the piece of legislation that gives people some uh, protections. And I remember um, going to this, uh, uh, they, they, called, uh, they called meetings throughout the province. The uh, Ontario Federation of Labour called meetings throughout the, uh, throughout the province. The one in Toronto, they called it a, a very uh, uh, worker-friendly luxury hotel boardroom somewhere. And uh, people went there and to their amazement, the turnout was so enormous was so enormous that they had to negotiate a second room and take the panels away, and it, it filled with people. And they got up and they started making these speeches about Harris is terrible and this is unconscionable and blah, blah, blah. And I can remember, excuse me, swearing, but there was, a, there was an old man, uh, a very quite an old man, who got up from the back of the room. I remember I was sitting there, it was incredible. He gets up and he goes, shut the fucking province down, like that. And, and everybody went, and then everybody goes, Shut the province down! Shut the and the whole room was this massive chanting of just working class people. Shut, shut the province down! Shut the province down! And I remember watching the man at the front who was directing the meeting, and he looked like a deer in the headlights. I mean, he was horrified that this was happening. It was the worst thing that could possibly have happened, as far as he was concerned. So, so you have to ask yourself, what would happen if instead of a man standing there going, oh my God, this is terrible, workers want to fight, what am I going to do, this is dreadful. Uh, if you actually had someone sitting there thinking, well, this is not yet a general strike, but by God, there's a lot of possibilities here. How do we build this? How do we start to uh, organise workers' actions? How do we start to unite with communities under attack? How do we start to build a working class common front that could actually defeat this government? If that was the kind of thinking, if that was the kind of orientation, that's when you'd have real, real possibilities. And that's the kind of thing that we've got to start actually setting in motion. And it is going to come. It is going to come. Uh, uh, it is going to come primarily from the base. It's going to come from rank and file workers. It's going to come from uh, from communities. And I just want to also just offer a comment on uh, electoral politics. And, and, I, and, I, and I said, you know, okay, candidly, we are, we're not in a position to, act, to to take a position in this election in terms of supporting electoral candidates. But let it let it be clear that, and as Jim intimated. There is, if there is the possibility of making gains, progressive gains, on an electoral basis, where that happens, overwhelmingly, it happens because there is a movement that's pushing it, that's pushing it forward. Um, I, I come from Britain, and uh, in, 1940, in 1945, in 1945, there was a. Uh, uh, there was a government elected that introduced the National Health Service, council housing, a whole series of things. But that took place in the context of a movement of working class people and an international movement of working class people that was pushing it forward. When the Ray government, the, the, the NDP government, was elected in 1990, uh, there was actually a movement on the campaign trail that was challenging the Liberals and driving nails into their coffin. And uh, the, uh, the NDP leadership at the time, I remember, looked at that. And, uh, and, and, you know, actually drew strength from that. 
I remember Bob Ray at a particular rally saying, uh, an anti-poverty rally, getting up and saying, the politics of poverty are only the reverse side of the politics of wealth. And I'll give him his credit, that was a very powerful thing to say. He neglected to mention which side he was on, but nonetheless, it was a very, very, it was a very, very important thing to say. Yeah, okay, well, wait, just one second, mate. Just finish, we'll get to you. Um, and then that was the uh, that was that was the thing that set things in motion. So yes, uh, if there is, to, if even if we are to consider an electoral strategy, it must be backed up by a, a working class social mobilisation strategy. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna go back there. If the object is anyone but Ford, um, and knowing that the cap is about mobilization, but what it feels like to me is like there's this powerful potential for shaming people who support Doug Ford and the Doug Ford agenda. And I feel like whatever actions or mobilizations uh, an organization chooses to make, a big part of it has to be to shame people into going through an internal process of thinking about what they're doing by supporting a Doug Ford administration. It doesn't mean lobbying them to vote for another candidate, uh, but shame is really, really powerful, right, as an emotional tool. And if it can be used politically, it can be really important. So I explained to a friend the other day the example of Obama's uh, being elected. Uh, and of course, Obama isn't the ideal progressive by any stretch. But there were people who voted for Obama because they would be ashamed of being deemed a racist if they didn't. There were tons of people that were, you know, the same type of people that would have kicked a couple black kids out of Starbucks for sitting around are the same people who probably would have voted for Obama and a big part of that campaign succeeded uh, on the strength of shaming people. And there's a, I, I think that there's a lot to that. And I think some of that means that you can't, um, and again, this is not in favor of respectability politics, but you can't other yourself as a movement because that prevents the shame reflex in them from seeing sort of the humanity in other people that are subject to the policies that Doug Ford represents. Um, so I, I just put that out there because, at least for me personally, I've had conversations with friends that have caused them to think differently about voting for Doug Ford. And it wasn't about organizing them, it was, it was about making them ashamed, right? Saying like, is that really what we think? Like, are we that low? So two questions, I think, in all of that. One was around uh, the Bernie Sanders uh, candidacy in the United States and what Corbyn is, what's happening with Corbyn in the UK right now. Can that provide any lessons for social movements here? Uh, and the second question was around, can shame be a political tool? So the, the questions asked around uh, around Bernie Sanders and, uh, and, and Jeremy Corbyn's uh, and, and, and the Labour Party. Um, I, think, I think the question is perhaps more clear-cut with Corbyn and the Labour Party in the sense that, that um, there really is what has emerged there, and, and there's a big mobilisation around Sard, Sard, uh, Bernie Sanders as well, but what's emerged clearly is um, an, incredible, uh, an incredible political development, an incredible political moment. Um, uh, Corbyn actually... He's not a young man, and he represented a, a, a group, a, what, we, what here would be called a, a caucus, uh, within uh, within the British Labour Party. Very small. I think I think it had nine nine members called the the campaign group that, that was trying to preserve a kind of a that was trying to preserve a, a socialist perspective within the Labour Party. And for years, the Labour Party had been had been moving in a rightward direction. Under the leadership of the war criminal Tony Blair, it went in disastrous, uh, in disastrous directions. And Corbyn won the leadership. And in winning the leadership, what's amazing is that, I mean, people are focused on Jeremy Corbyn, this Jeremy Corbyn, that, but the real incredible thing about the situation there is the extent to which it has created, uh, the, the organization is called Momentum, but it is Momentum. 
There's, there's been real, there's been an incredible political development, a rejuvenation of that party, a rift with the uh, austerity consensus. And, uh, and people, are, people are looking uh, with a great sense of hope. Now, it's quite fragile, uh, I know there's no guarantees about where things will go, but it's quite clear that if you look at either Sanders or Corbyn, you look at, in fact, it's a, it's a vindication of how much of an appetite there is for actually something different. How much of the, a, a, an appetite there is for radical alternatives? Because the point is right, and, it, and then we go over to the, the shaming question. I mean, there are a group of Ford supporters who are indeed shameless. Uh, they are right-wing, they are racists, and when Ford stands up and says, uh, we need to take care of our own first, I mean, he's pretty stupid, but he's not that stupid. He understands what he's saying when he says something like that. He understands the dog whistle that he's blowing. And he knows there's a whole constituency of people who are lapping that stuff up and who love that. But there's also a lot of people who may be tempted to vote for Tory candidates because they buy in at this point to the, to the populist claim to represent some kind of challenge to the establishment, to be challenging elites. And there may be people who end up voting for Doug Ford, who down the road will be out with us fighting, uh, fighting back. So, I mean, it's a, it's a relatively complicated question, but the point clearly is this, is that in order to break that stranglehold of this fake uh, anti-establishment right populism, there has to be a radical left alternative that has to exist. Um, uh, something approaching that, at least, is uh, it emerges in Britain. I don't know that it exists here at the present time, but those are the, uh, those are the, the things that can, uh, can make a difference. But what is absolutely important and absolutely imperative is that we actually begin the process of organising that movement to challenge and to, to fight back. Because that's the thing that makes the difference. Because in my experience, and I've been at this for a while in terms of mobilising around poverty issues, it's amazing how little people learn by getting kicked. It's amazing how much people do learn by fighting back. It's amazing how much people can understand when they take to the streets, when they get a sense of hope, when they get a sense of confidence. And we've got to start providing that confidence. When Harris came in, in the 90s, those who remember it, may remember that there was this stunned period of passivity. Everybody was going, oh dear, this happened, this is the end, fascism has arrived, we're done for, there's nothing to be done, and people who you had some hope would be sort of standing up and trying to organise a fight back, we're not doing that. Um, but uh, we can't allow that to happen this time. We have to be right from the beginning ensuring that, that, that there's a fight back and that that alternative is being posed. And I would be the first to agree that while we are going to fight on the issues that we have to fight on right now, let's be quite clear that we have to build a movement along decidedly anti-capitalist lines. We're not just fighting Doug Ford. We're not just fighting a right-wing variant of the austerity agenda. We're fighting a system that is poisoning this plan. We're fighting a system in which handfuls of people have more wealth than billions of people. We're fighting a system that is fundamentally bankrupt and uh, all the struggles that we take up today must contribute to actually changing this society and ending this system of capital. I got Miguel and then yourself. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, I listened with attention to the first two uh, uh, questions by the public. And I, I, came, I come to understand that one of the disasters of this base of action was that union leaders don't, talk, don't think like us. Don't think like the grassroots people. What guarantees do we have that this time around they're not going to pull the plug and uh, throw us under the bus again? as they work it, they, the poor people that we are. Thank you very much. Um, I was listening to CEC. I don't know if people were listening to um, the new uh, phone-in and Rob Ford, or sorry, um, Rob Ford, God help us. Uh, Doug Ford uh, was actually being interviewed and there was a, a retired school teacher who said her greatest concern right now is the rise of factless rhetoric and that's happening like all over the world. I love, John, that you said that it's the, it's Rob Ford, or the Fords, the Trumps, it's just, they're just a figurehead for the sickness that's happening right now. 
And I don't know if people are interested or not, I wasn't planning on doing this, but Tom and I wrote a song called Factless Rhetoric, um, and it talks about the system. So I don't know if it's possible that we could pass the song oh, on. Oh, closing time, sister. Can we have some questions answered, please? I'm sorry? Can we have that closing song at the end? Yes. Yeah, if people are open to hearing that, because it's, it's all, it, it's in, it was in response and written because of our concern about Duck Board. So, yeah. Um, I have, were there more hands? Okay, then I have one more question to ask. Maybe you could respond to all three. Um, well, during the days of action and the kinds of uh, fight back that we're talking about, that comes at a cost. It did back then as well in terms of um, arrests and other kinds of uh, repression that's likely to uh, accompany any kind of serious fight back to a hard right government. Um, so I'm curious, what did OCAP learn from that period of uh, a sort of escalated attack? That could be useful now. Um, okay, so maybe I'll take the I'll take Miguel's one last because I think it's a very important question. Um, and yeah, I mean I think. The, the, the sort of the concept of Ford as the as the the, the man who puts forward the, the factless claims and all the rest of it is fundamentally true, but I think that really goes with the whole right wing populist shtick. Uh, he sort of he sort of wallows in ignorance and backwardness. He actually says that he's going to defund the CBC when the pro provincial level of government doesn't have anything to, de to do with the CBC. He says he's going to fire someone uh, who works for a private corporation that he can't fire. I mean, those kinds of, those kinds of things. But to some extent, uh, his core group, I don't think I'm talking about people generally, but his core group of supporters sort of rather lap that up because they like the sort of the earthy Doug Ford who's not one of these sophisticated types. And, uh, and and you know gets his things muddled, but by God he's got you know that, that sort of that sort of that's part of it, the nonsense. But Ford is not uh, you know a, a person who comes from a working class background who has not learned to speak publicly and be articulate. He's just a boorish right wing multi millionaire thug, and uh, and he uh, and he's uh, he, he, the whole thing is nonsense and needs to be called. But the the sort of the the support that exists for him, such as he's able to win it around this vague notion of change, that can evaporate with incredible speed, given given the reality of what he will implement and the possibilities of, uh, of building a movement against him. Um, when it comes to yeah, when it comes to escalation, um, we're going to have to escalate in the face of a Tory attack, and that will involve um, that will involve some level of you know dealing with cops and intensified police repression and that kind of stuff. And we did face a lot of that. Um, I think the trick, however, is to rely on the strength of the movement, to push forward with as much determination as possible, but to not be isolated, to put your faith in, in, building, uh, in building movements. When, when we went to Queen's Park in June 15th of 2000, um, something that became known as the Queen's Park riot took place. And this was a situation where we took 1,500 people to the legislature, we demanded to address the legislature, um, they told us that was constitutionally impossible, and they were lying, but we didn't really care anyway. We were just demanding that homeless people be allowed to address them. And we thought there'd be some negotiations or whatever, but they, they decided to attack the crowd with riot cops and horses and all the rest of it. And then they imagined that they were just going to be able to round us up and arrest us and, and shut us down. And the fact is that we got incredible support. We got an incredible amount of support. Um, and I, I, I felt that at that time, though we faced real challenges, we weren't isolated. We did have real strength from unionized workers, from people in communities, and, and, and we got through it. We got through it with, with, with some ease, even, even when, um, I just, read, uh, I just read about some right-wing racist fascist in the UK who goes to jail and gets beaten up. When OCAP members went to jail, and I, I was in Whitby jail, and I tell you, there was so much support amongst the prisoners for us. There was so much 
uh, respect and, and kindness shown to us. And I, I remember being out in the exercise yard and people in the other range all going like that, the windows and everything. I mean, there was there, there was a real there was real amazing there was real amazing support. So we felt uh, during that period we faced enormous challenges and difficulties, but we felt a great deal of strength. And I think the secret this time around is going to do an even better job. In fact, a far better job of ensuring that we are rooted in a movement that is too big and too powerful for them to deal with as a, as a police problem and one they have to deal with as a, uh, as a political problem. And Miguel's question is really decisive. I know Miguel and I have some significant differences around the question of trade unions because, in my opinion, no offence, but I think Miguel sometimes conflates unions themselves with union bureaucracies. Um, but the reality is that what happened during the days of action was not unheard of. Uh, the fact that, that a group of union leaders marched to the edge of a really serious confrontation and decided it wasn't for them is not a unique experience to Ontario. Um, I, I, I want to relay, uh, I want to relay a, an incredible uh, account of a, of a meeting that took place uh, in 1919 with a, a group of trade union leaders in, in, in Britain. With uh, the Liberal Party was still a major force at that time in Britain and there was a Liberal Prime Minister called David Lloyd George. And it's 1919. And workers in Britain have formed what's called a triple alliance of railway workers, transport workers and miners. And um, this is an account given by the miners leader, Robert Smiley, that he told to a Labour MP called Anaya and Bevan. So Smiley recalls that uh, he's invited, along with the t other two union leaders, to go and meet with David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. And they go into number 10 Downing Street, and there's Lloyd George, and Lloyd George says to them, gentlemen, he says, um, you have created with your triple alliance an incredibly powerful weapon. Uh, in fact, I think I have to tell you that the government of this country is at your mercy. If you strike, there is no doubt that you will defeat the government. Um, we can't even rely on the troops. They've just fought a war. We've already had mutinies breaking out in a number of camps. If we deployed the troops against you, I believe they'd probably take your side. We are at your mercy. He said, but I ask you to consider this. If a force arises within a state that is more powerful than a state, it must either uh, be prepared to take over from the state or accept the authority of the state and withdraw. Have you considered, and if you have, are you ready? And Smiley's comment at that moment was, at that time we were beaten and we knew we were beaten. Because what you had was a situation where they were in charge, they were leading a movement of working class people that was so strong that it could actually defeat the government, it could actually defeat the capitalists. And they didn't want to go through with that. They didn't want to lead such a movement. And I would suspect, though it wasn't quite as dramatic a situation, but I think it's extremely likely that not too dissimilar type of conversations took place uh, amongst union leaders during the days of action. Yeah. Um, so there you have it. There you have it. Uh, and that is going to be a real factor. That's going to be a real factor in the situation. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, but that's why we've got to build. Uh, uh, we've got to build this movement from the base. We've got to build this movement from the base, and we'll work with trade union leaders. Of course, we will when trade union leaders move forward and, 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 and actually take up struggles. But at every point, they, they've got to feel that pressure. They've got to feel that pressure coming through the movement, and we've got to build a movement that's strong enough to actually to actually uh, push things forward. So uh, Miguel's concerns about uh, trade unions are not by any means entirely unfounded. There's a very very big great big massive great wheelbarrow full of a grain of salt uh, in, what, uh, in what Miguel says. Okay, so with all of that said, thank you very much. Uh, please stay for the song and we'll see you next time and see you in the streets. Thank you. The fabulous rhetoric I think has a kind of a easy theme. Rhetoric. Fabulous rhetoric. Backless rhetoric. Climate change is a name. Nature does not cut a deal. What's words? What's the next one? What? Nuclear is clean and green.
Okay, let's start at the beginning. Factless. 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 Climate change is a dream. Nature does not cut a deal. Nuclear is clean and green. But the waste is so obscene. Chemtrails don't exist. What is all that toxic mist? Guns provide security. I hope they don't shoot you and me. Factless rent. Factless rent. Factless rent. We are not a holy state. Because we do not practice hate. Peacekeepers are sent offshore. End up fighting in a war. We are a global village. Why all the rape and pillage? Tax cuts lead to jobs. Look at all those angry mobs. Factless rent. Factless rent. Factless Thank you. 